So let's pick up where we were last time. A lot to get through today, so let's just jump right into it. Um, we wanted to show that x and y were integers. Then if 2 divides x over minus 5.
and then if x is odd, then my x squared minus 5 is going to be equal to 2k plus 1 squared minus 5 for some, did I use k already? No. For some integer k. Right? The fact that x is odd means I can write x as in this form. And now I'm just going to expand. So this gives us 4k squared plus 4k plus 1 minus 5, which is 4k squared plus 4k minus 4. Or in other words, that's just 4 times k squared plus k minus 1. So we see that x squared minus 5 is actually equal to divides 2n squared plus 1 implies that 3 
does not divide n, i.e. that if 3 divides n, then 3 does not divide to n squared plus 1 by the contrary positive. Okay. So you can just write that down in the first sentence. You're not assuming it because you're putting where you need to show. And just make sure you never assume it at any point. But you just want to announce where you, what you need to prove. Um, you can also decide to write down even further what does that mean. Right? So when you write 3 divides n, this is why knowing definitions are important. When you write 3 divides n, what does that mean? Plus one or three L plus two? It has to be three L plus one or two n squared plus one must be equal to three L plus two. Okay. So this is you kind of writing down what ultimately what you need to end up showing here. Right. So to prove the forward implication, we need to prove this is true. Dealing with this obviously it seems very complicated, so you might want to think about the contrapositive, which is that. So to prove the contrapositive means you need to assume n is 3k, and then you need to show that one of these two situations happen. Okay? So now you have a strategy for the proof. Right? And that's how you kind of build on strategies. Write down what it is that you need to show, then go through for each part of that and write down the definition of what that means. And the mathematical definition, right? Not like in words or anything. Be able to write down equations to represent things so you can, you, you can actually get something concrete to head towards. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. Assume that 3 divides n. That is, n is equal to 3k for some k, integer k. Then, ultimately what we want to show is this is equal to that, or this is equal to that. So let's just write that down and figure out what it is equal to. 2n squared plus 1 would be equal to, if my n is 3k, I can plug it in here. And then that would be equal to This is true, and what does that mean? 
This means that your 2n squared plus 1 is a multiple of k, a multiple of 3. So even before you even start the proof or write it down, you know exactly what you need to show. So there are two possibilities for what you need to assume, so this is obviously going to give you a proof by cases. <clears throat> there are two cases that you'll end up with by assuming this. And you need to show that either one of those cases that you assume, this is going to be the result. You'll be able to write the 2n squared plus 1 as some multiple of 3. So we assume that 3 does not divide n. This gives us two cases. One, n is equal to three k plus one, or two, n is equal to three k plus two. In case one, we would have two n squared plus one, and this is for some k, and this is for some k. I, I can reuse the letter here because the cases will not overlap, right? So when I'm doing this, I'm assuming that's not happening. When I'm doing this, I'm assuming that's not happening. So I don't have to worry about any overlapping notation here. These are two different scenarios, right? I can be in this case or that case. I can't be in both. You can't have something being represented in two different ways. Why? Division algorithm. There are unique ways you can write any integer in this form, right? So I know it's not possible to have both at the same time, so I don't have to worry about overlapping. But um, in general, you might want to call things different just in case. But here it's clear that the two cases cannot happen simultaneously. So let's move on. 2 here, if I plug in 3k plus 1 for n, because I'm in case 1. So now I will have 9k squared plus 6k plus 1 plus 1. So that will be 3 times, I can factor out a 3 here, that will be 3, that's 6k squared plus 4k plus 1, which means that 3 divides 2n squared plus 1. In case 2, Two n squared plus one would be equal to two times three k plus two squared plus one. So to recap, the statement was apply implication. You saw an if and only if, I, F, F, which means you have to prove two directions at the same time. We focused on this direction, which is that statement. Um, dealing with this part seemed more complicated. We want to deal with the last part, so what we did was a contrapositive. So we know that ultimately this is what we have to show. Um, but in order to help us know where we want to kind of start and where we want to kind of end up, we write down what the meaning of these symbols are. So 3 divides n means this is true. 3 does not divide it means one of these two cases happen. So it means then, in your proof, you need to assume this is true and prove that either this or this is true as a consequence. So that's what we did. So 
I assume my angle is 3k, then my 2n squared plus 1 ends up being this expression, which is in this form. So that part gets proven. Then we go in the other direction, right, which is this way, which I wrote it down this way, but you see the arrows pointing in the right ways. And then I can first write down what that means, what this means, and I know I need to start on either situation here and end up in this situation. That gave me a proof by cases. One of two things could happen. In the first case, it ends up being a multiple of three. And in the second case, it ends up being a multiple of three, which means it'll always be a multiple of three, and that ends the proof. Yeah. yeah I have a, like a random silly question. For that part, right? How do I truly know that there isn't some other kind of method where I could get it into three divides? Like into. Oh, there might be. I'm not saying there isn't. No, no, no. Like, so, like, like I think, no, what I'm saying is that, like, how do I know that there isn't, like, some other way where I can actually show the opposite is true? Like, for that, right? Some sort of identity or some kind of, like, part of math theorems or something. Like, for, like, I guess this goes for, like, any proof in general. Because, like, you know, like, how you start with something and then you're, like, manipulating with what you have, mm -hmm. right? Like, and I chose, like, a particular path. Yeah. But how do I truly know that there isn't something else out there that would cause a hiccup than that? Because the path that you chose, you're taking logical steps at any given time. You're taking steps that you know are guaranteed to be true by some truth table in the background. And any other step that gets you to the same answer would give you an equivalent step, which means that all the truth values would also be the same at that situation. All right, so that's one way you can know. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm right, just gonna say um, when you get all the cases, that's like the form of partitioning the. Uh, you are partitioning the integers, yes. No, like let's say some crazy thing where it's like maybe one has another form, and then I do some kind of math on it, and then I'm somehow able to get it to like some kind of contradiction. Does that happen a lot? Like I hear cases. Of no, not really. What can happen is there. There's sometimes where you think. Just like in the previous example, when we started this class off with, we started the proof with uh, the contrapositive, and we got to this point where it seemed like, oh, this must be proven false. But then you have to fully examine that, and you realize that it actually wasn't going to end up being the case. Um, but the idea is, once you get something to work, by doing one logical sequence of steps, meaning every step you take you know is true, because it has to be true. There's no other possibility. Um, because of how we set up the logic, something that is true or false, it's not both, it's not neither. Right? This is the system we're working. Every time you make a logical step, you are saying this is true, this is true, means that if you, someone were to take some other step, it can't prove your statement false, because that means it's true and it's false. But would there be any hiccups from like, some other like, branch? Of and the thing is, if there's going to be a hiccup, for that reason, you're going to know like, you wouldn't get it to finish if you encounter a hiccup in a proof. It means that you wouldn't be able to make the next step because there's something that's going to stop you from doing that. Right? So it's even in the other proof, when we had that hiccup, where we got to this point where it's like, where we had the thing looking like this, that was a hiccup because that would stop me from making the claim that I wanted to make. We're like, uh-oh, wait, something's off here. And then you examine the hiccup to actually see, is it actually a hiccup or is it a mirage? So that can happen. But once you actually prove something to be true mathematical, no one can ever prove it false. Wait, wait, wait. Would there be like something wrong with like how like, the axioms or like the given like rules that you want to play with or something? Because I've heard times... Yes, like, yes, that, that is another case, right? Mm -hmm. that, that we'll explore more when we get to the other book, this idea of axioms. I know I mentioned what they are. Um, but at the end of the day, to prove anything, you need to assume something, right? So you can start off with a set of axioms, and this says, these are the moves I'm allowed to make, right? Now, as long as you make steps consistent with that, you are proven to be true within that system of axioms. But someone can, might contest, maybe this axiom is not good. And then you get proven wrong. That's not to say what you did is wrong, it's just to say within you, that system that that other person wants to promote, it's wrong in that system, but in my system it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
And you have things like that in, in mathematics. But when we're, the way we set up our logic, anyone who takes our set of axioms, no matter what path they take, we should all get to the same answer. Because we're all working all according to the same logic. But yeah, there are parts in math where a different set of axioms can give different results. So you'll have a lot of books. You won't encounter situations like that though unless it's at a really high level. There's sometimes where you get to a point in math where the book has to start out saying something like, we assume the axiom of choice is true for everything in this textbook, right? Some people don't like that. And the textbooks would be very different. Right? So you'll say, we assume the axiom of choice is true, we're gonna study this topic. And you can derive a whole bunch of things. Someone who didn't assume that axiom is true would derive a different bunch of things. And it's not that one is true or false, it's just that within the context that we're working with, this is truth. Within that context, this is truth. And within a given context, paths, different paths leading to the same truth will all be equal. You'll never have to worry about someone proving what you did is false as long as they're using your set of axioms. It's not, it's not an axiom. move on to another context. So we're, we're still doing direct proof and proof by counterpositive, but I want to introduce a bunch of contexts to you. One is going to call, be called the congruence of integers. It's again piggybacking on divisibility, and ultimately we're going to show how that can partition the integers in terms of divisibility, which when we're doing cases is what we're actually doing. So we're going to talk about the congruence of integers. Let's actually talk about what this kind of means. And usually we'll use the word mod, like hardly anyone says module. They'll just sort this and say mod. Right? A is congruent to B mod n, or A is equivalent to B mod n. This is the notation for writing that, and this is what it actually means. N actually divides the difference. Um, so let's talk about some consequences of what this might mean. Note this means the following. To say that n divides a minus b, what am I saying? What does that notation mean? We just we look at it. There is a simple integer such that a minus b is equal to n. 
n times k for some k which is an integer, right? In other words, I can write a is equivalent to n k plus b, or sometimes write b plus n k, which again kind of looks like a division algorithm. Um, but we're not even concerned with the uniqueness part in this case. We're just saying these are equivalent. So that's what it means. It means you can write one integer as the other integer plus some multiple of that n. Um, here's another important consequence. And it's going to come into the form of a theorem, which after this point, you can use this idea without proof. You can just mention it at any given time, and it will be fine. In fact, a lot of people take this as synonymously, synonymous with the definition. Some people might even define it this way. <coughs> A is equivalent to B mod N. If and only if. A and B have the same remainder when divided by one. Right? So a lot of times conceptually it's nicer to think of it this way, right? And you can talk about things a lot easier that way. So I can say 2 is equivalent to 16 mod 2. Right? They're both divisible by 2 and give you a remainder 0. Um, minus 17 is equivalent to 335 mod 2. I can, I can talk about that and I can know I'm saying right without too much work because if I'm talking about mod 2, I'm talking about odds and evens. And so any odd integer is equivalent to any other odd integer mod 2 because they would have the same remainder when you divide by 2. So this is kind of a, a very nice way to think about it, but it's kind of something that you have to prove from the definition that this is actually always true. Um, let's actually prove that. Proof. Um, let's go this way. Okay, what do we do? Yeah? Uh, so I just have a question now. So, kind of for like any uh, value n, you could partition that group uh, the into n size. Right. Is this just so, a way of writing? So like, it'd be another way of me even saying this, or another consequence of me saying this, which is kind of what Lewis alluded to, which we'll kind of get into in chapter 8. So this is kind of jumping the gun, but I can just kind of mention um, some things that, so when you see it again, it'll be familiar. This kind of means when you're talking about mod 2, there are only two equivalent classes that we might say. So we can have two sets, right? So I can say, oh, for example, 0 is in one set, right? When I divide that by 2, the remainder is 0. What are the other kinds of numbers when I divide by 2, the remainder is 0? Well, plus or minus 2, that would work. Plus or minus 4, that would work. Plus or minus 6, that would work. And so on. Right? Um, pick the first number that we see that's missing from the set, like the number 1. Put it in the other set. And now, OK, if I divide that by 2, the remainder is 1. What other numbers would that work for? Well, it would also work for minus 1. Right? It would also work for plus or minus 3, plus or minus 5, plus or minus 7, da, da, da. And you realize that now there's no one that you missed in either list. So this is actually a partition. They will not intersect each other, right? Because of division algorithm. There's a unique way to write this guy in terms of remainders. Now if you talk about mod 3, we have kind of a different scenario, right? Talk about the integer 0. His remainder is 0 when you divide by 3. What other numbers is this true for? Well, obviously 3. Or obviously any multiple of 3, this will be true for. Then you can pick, who's the first guy where that did not work? Well, we missed 1. Remainder is 1 when you divide by 3. Who else has a remainder of 1 when you divide by 3? 4. Well, 4. Who else? Seven. Seven. Well, ten. Ten. ten, and so on. And then, okay, who's the first guy missing from this list? Well, two. Right? He has a remainder of two when you divide by three. What other things have a remainder of two when you divide by three? Five. Um, 
you need right there. You'll notice that if I look just at the positives, I'm actually catching everyone. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I'm missing no one, right? There are literally only three possible sets. They will never intersect because the division algorithm says this is unique. And they will actually partition the integers. No one will be missed at the end of the day. So modulo three, we can always um, use this as a partition. And in some sense, think of all the numbers in a set as equivalent to other numbers in the set when it comes down to division by this guy, right? And so that's why my example with odds and evens, it was pretty easy. I know all odd integers are in this group. All even integers are in this group. Therefore, any two even integers are equivalent mod 2. Any odd integers are equivalent mod 2. Um, but that's really, we're jumping ahead of ourselves. These sets here, they're called equivalence classes because they are partitions that are generated by some sort of equivalence idea happening. And we'll talk about a lot of consequences that have to do with that as well. But that's kind of where we're going. So yes, guys that are equivalent modulo sum integer, they will all be a part of what we call an equivalence class, which means that anyone that's equivalent to them, you will be able to put these guys all in a set, and ultimately you'll be able to partition all the integers into these distinct groups, which kind of talks, which kind of gives us a way of, if we want to prove something about integers and a divisibility of some integer, we'll always have a way of partitioning all the integers to cover all possible cases. Right? So, it, which is a really nice consequence. Um, but really, it's, it's much later when we're going to talk about that. Um, let's go this way. What are we, we going to say? We need to show that if A is equivalent to B mod N, then A and B have same remainder. When divided by n. What does this mean? A minus B, which means that A can be written as B plus N times K for some K in integer. Right? What does this mean? To say A and B have the same remainder when we divide by N. A and B can be written as some NK here. So I can say A is something like NL plus R. Call that L1. And my B can be written as N of L2 plus R, but the R's would be the same. Right? I, I'm guaranteed to be able to write them like this way by the division algorithm, and those two are the same, is saying that they have the same remainder. Okay. So I need to show that if I assume this, this will have to be true. Okay. So assume A is equal to B mod N then this means that a is equal to b plus nk for some integer k. Now let's invoke the division algorithm. By the division algorithm, we can find unique Q1 and R1 in the integers with R being between 0 and B such that I can write B is equal to Q1 times N plus R1. And my R and Q are unique, right? Which means that as long as I can write A in this form with R1, I know it's exactly the same remainder. But, by assumption, A is equal to this. But that would mean 
that my A is equal to put this guy in for B. And that would mean that my A can be written in this way. Chapter 8, 
um, you will realize how important this idea is, but for now we're going to prove um, some facts about it. And then, for those of you who are math majors and go into abstract algebra, you will know, realize a lot of other things about this. Example. Show that if A is equivalent to B mod N, then I can multiply both sides of this equivalence relationship, and the relationship is meant to be. If I know A and B are equivalent mod N, if they have the same remainder when divided by N, then any multiple of A will have the same remainder when divided by N as any multiple of B. That same multiple. Examples seem to help to show the kinds of manipulations we can do with this symbol. <coughs> so if A is equivalent to B mod N, and C is equivalent to D mod N, then here's something that we does not work with equal sign that we work here. I can multiply both sides of the equivalence by different numbers, and the equivalence can still hold. Turns out that A times C would be equivalent to B times D mod N. So that's something that works here that would not work with an equation under normal circumstances, right? If you multiply an equation by different numbers on both sides, you kill the equation. Right? Um, but it turns out with equivalence, you can still maintain that relationship provided that these numbers, even though they're different, 
they're equivalent in terms of the divisibility. And that will still actually work. Right, so it's harder to break a congruence than it is to break an, an, an equality, is what we're showing here. Proof. Again, I'll, I'll do directly here. I think that's nice. Assume A is equivalent to B mod N and C is equivalent to D mod N. Okay, what does that mean? A is equivalent to B plus N. Then that means that A is equal to B plus N times K, and C is equal to D plus N, L. N times L for integers K and L. Then? <coughs> then what? Then multiplying this is the same as multiplying those. Yeah. So that's what we're going we're to do. Because I want to be able to say something about AC, what that's equal to. So it's actually just multiplying. Then AC is equal to B plus NK times D plus NL. And distributive law. So this is BD plus BNL plus k plus n squared k. This is equal to b to d plus n times b l plus uh, d k plus n k. And so those two will have the same remainder divided by n. So you have a congruence, you can multiply the two sides by the same number and it will maintain the congruence, much like an equal sign. Something not like an equal sign is this idea. You can actually multiply both sides by a different number and maintain the congruence, as long as those two numbers are equal.
right, where this happens sometimes, right? Sometimes you find a property that you care about, okay, divisible by some integer and having the same remainder. So you find some sort of notation and machinery to express this idea in a very concise way. Um, but then you want to know, what is the extent of this machinery? What can it do? I've created a monster. Do I know all its powers? Do I know every rule that it will obey? So you start asking questions. Are all the rules that I'm familiar with for some other operation working here? Right? And so you just start throwing questions out there. OK, multiply both sides by the same thing. Everything is OK. Is adding things OK? Is subtracting things OK? Right? What is OK to do with this notation? Right? So you start to throw some questions out there. And then you answer your questions right? by trying to prove them. Right? So you can't just say, oh, this seems to make sense. No, you have to say, why does that actually make sense? So we believe it's true, so let's actually try to prove that, okay? Um, so let's try to do a direct proof of this study. Um, <coughs> so assume A is equivalent to B mod N, and C is equivalent to D mod N, then that means A equals B plus N K, and C equals D plus N L for k l into this. Right so we think they're doing it. Huh? So it's right there at that point. So we can add them. You can add them, right? Last time we subtracted them, I believe. We sub we, I think we subtracted something somewhere. But here we can add these two, right? So this meant that a plus c, right? So if I add the left sides, I get this. But the left sides are the same as the right sides. So if I add the right sides, I should get the same thing. That's just B plus D plus N times K plus L. And so I see that A plus C is equal to B plus D plus a multiple of N, which of course means that A plus C is equivalent to B plus D mod N. So this is actually true. Right, so we hazard a guess, and it turns out our guess was correct. We couldn't just pretend it's correct, though. We had to show that it works out with our definition. What about this guess? Would this be correct? Given an equivalence, can I just add something to both sides and it'll be okay? What do you think? Base equivalent to B mod N, then A plus C is equivalent to B plus C mod N for any integer C. Um, isn't this the same as the last one? Because I'm assuming C is just congruent to C. Or can, can is that true? Is C congruent to C? I don't know, is congruent the same as equal? <laughs> Not really, because sometimes they Congruent isn't the same as equal, but congruent means they have the same remainder. So, yes. Yeah. So, this is a corollary. <laughs> which I always forget just how to spell that word. Of the previous. Um, it, it'll be nice if I use a different letter. Let's use D here and D here. So I can just make E. So I'll make a comment, and you'll see you'll clearly see where I'm substituting, making the substitutions. So it's E, E. Right? So I have a congruence, I can add any integer to both sides and maintain the congruence. And this is just a corollary of previous theorem. Choose. Wait, is that true? Uh, what do we have here? Choose C equals D equals E. And we're done. That's why it's a problem. It's just a very straightforward fact that you don't have to do a lot of work for. Because if I go through this proof and <coughs> choose both C and D to be the same thing, choose those both to be E, 
you'll notice that I ended up adding E to both sides. Right, so C and D are equal to E. That will work. And clearly E and E is equivalent to E mod N because it, it has the same remainder when divided by N. You can also do that by the definition. Um, we know that E is equivalent to E mod N since N divides E minus E, which is N dividing zero. And N does divide zero, right? here, then we will do some proofs about real numbers, then some proofs about sets, then some proofs about Cartesian products, and then we can end the chapter, which I don't think we'll get to all that today, but let's go to the smart sets. But all this we'll come back to. This equivalence relationship is a very important relationship. We'll come back to this specific relationship, equivalence in terms of divisibility, but we'll also talk about equivalence as a general idea. Right? So pick some property that you really like, and let's find out if we can find properties that are equivalent to that. Or what kind of elements would be equivalent to elements under that property, and what that would mean in a general sense. But that's chapter 8. Keep jumping ahead of ourselves. Let's do two more quick examples, just so you get used to this idea. Let A and B be integers. If A is equivalent to 5 mod 6, right? Meaning, when you divide um, A by 6, the remainder is 5. There's another way you can express that. And B is equivalent to 3 mod 4. Meaning when you divide B by 4, you will have a remainder of 3, and B can be any inter such integer. Then, this is true. 4A plus 6B is equivalent to 6 mod 8. Thank you. 
4a plus 6b equals <coughs>
But, but that's something you have to prove. Yeah. And it would still be muddy? Hmm? I mean? Sorry, in that uh, case, if you were to go about it that way, maybe, you know, in a more complex example, that's, uh, you're using bigger, bigger numbers, but... It would still be muddy, yeah. Oh. And there's probably also some more general phrase that would work as well, but it will definitely work tomorrow. Because it's like we're dealing with divisibility, so this is like us manipulating a common factor kind of thing. It's not going to really change. Um, would you prove that? You, you would have to prove this. We didn't prove this. We proved it. Prove we proved the other way. Oh, we proved this way mm -hmm. earlier. Like this is something you have to prove. Um, here's another one. <coughs> At first glance, it might look remind you of Fermat's little theorem, but um, we wouldn't really prove it directly. Um, but we're going to prove it for the number three. Prove that a cube is equivalent to a mod three. All right, there's something that says a to the p is equivalent to a mod p if p is prime. This is called Fermat's little theorem. You can prove that in general, it's not going to be. It will, it will take us knowing a little bit more about prime numbers to be able to say that. But um, I'm telling you about a particular instance specifically for the prime 3. This is true, and we don't need to know any more than what we already know in order to prove this. Um, Right. So if you prove in this, you can just say, oh, that's just a corollary. Choose P equals 3. Uh, but we're going to prove this from scratch. Uh, I guess how do we do that? Mod 3. 1. 
Either A is equivalent to 0 mod 3, which means that A is equal to 3K2, or A is equivalent to 1 mod 3, which means A is equal to 3K plus 1, or 3, A is equal to 3K plus 2. And the K, I'm writing the same K, but each case is distinct, right? For K in an integer.
uh, two months or even so to make you, and a direct computation will do that. So I can just write that out a little bit for you guys if you want to see. If a is equal to 3k plus 1, then your a cubed is going to be 3k plus 1 cubed. That's going to be 3k cubed plus 3 times 3k squared plus 3 times 3k plus 1, which at this point you can factor out a 3 from everything here, and then you have a plus 1. Um, and in the case, so that means it's equivalent to 1 mod 3, just like how a is equivalent to 1 mod 3. If my a was 3k plus 2, um, if my a was 3k plus 2, then I would have my a cubed would be 3k cubed plus 3 times 3, 3 k squared times 2 <coughs> plus 3 times 3k times 4 plus 8. And I'd be able to write this 8 as 6 plus 2. And so then I'd be able to factor 3 from everyone here, because there's a 3 here, a 3 here, a 3 here. And there's a 3 factor in 6. And I'd be able to write this as 2. Looking at a cube, the expression a cube minus a, you can write it says a times a squared minus 1, which you can write as a minus 1 times a times a plus 1. And in the case where your a is 3k, plug in 3k here, then the whole thing is a multiple of 3, so it's equivalent to 0 mod 3. Um, if your k plus 1, plug then this term here will give you the factor of 3. So they're equivalent to 0 mod 3. And then if I have the k plus 2, this term will give you a multiple of 3. So then I will end up, you will end up being able to conclude from this that your a cubed minus a is equivalent to 0 mod 3. And then I add a to both sides, which we proved that we can do. Can you say that like any three consecutive numbers will well, one of them will be divisible by three. Yeah. yeah. We'll actually do that by the division algorithm, but it's a reinforcement looking at congruence. Mm -hmm. It's a double confirmation that that will be true. Let's look at some proofs about real numbers. By going through cases, I want to show you another proof technique, which I'm going to use a bunch of lemmas. Um, so triangle inequality says, sometimes you might shorten it this way, triangle inequality. This says, for any real numbers x, y, in R, the following holds. <clears throat> you 
take the absolute value of x plus y, it will be less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of y. This is called the triangle inequality. It's called the triangle inequality because the idea to use this inequality came from geometry. But if you think of, about um, two lines connected, they made a triangle. Um, in terms of, let's say this were a vector x and that were a vector y, then the length here is the magnitude of x, the length here is the magnitude of y, and this would be the vector x plus y, and, and then you can talk about the length of that. Right? And it turns out the shortest distance between two paths is a straight line, so if I take this distance plus that distance, it will be greater than just taking this straight distance and we obtain this inequality. So it makes sense when we're drawing a picture, but pictures aren't proof. You have to show that that's actually true in every possible case, in every weird triangle that you can possibly construct. This, this will hold true. It turns out that it's always true. Um, and it's, always, it's true even in higher dimensions, which makes it a very useful fact. Let's start about some definitions first. Let x be in R, then who remembers the definition of the absolute value of x? Is equal to x and x is uh, It's minus x if x is less than zero. That's the definition of the absolute value. You remember what its graph looks like. It looks like this guy, this here, and then that guy. So on this side, it has the equation y equals minus x for all negative x's. On that side, it has y equals x for all positive x's. So it actually is a piecewise function. You can think about it as a piecewise function. So if your number is 0 or positive, it won't do anything. If your number inside is negative, though, it will take the negative of that number. So you can say things like absolute value of 1 is 1, where the absolute value of negative 1 is also 1. So you can think of it as this thing that always keeps things positive. It takes the positive magnitude of any number that you probably use. It. <coughs> so that's the definition. Um, I want to prove some numbers for you. So ultimately, we're going to do about uh, one, two, three, four proofs. And we end at 12 10. Yeah. Okay. So here's the lemma. For all x in R, it turns out that x would be less than or equal to its absolute value. That's the first one. Let x be in R, meaning any real number, then we have two cases. Either x is greater than zero or x is less than zero. And let's deal with each case individually. If x is greater than or equal to zero, then by definition our absolute value of x is x. And so x is less than or equal to the absolute value of x holds. In fact, in positive, on, on the positive ones, on the non-negative numbers, they're equal. Okay? Or if our x is less than zero, Then, if you remember things about inequalities, your minus x would be greater than zero. Because if you multiply an inequality on both sides by a negative sign, you will flip the inequality. Thus, we have that the absolute value of x would be equal to minus x by this definition. 
but that is greater than zero, and by assumption, that is greater than x. This means that the absolute value of x is greater than x, and so x less than equal to the absolute value of x whole state. So this equality happens by definition of absolute value. And this inequality here holds by the assumption. Because we're under that assumption. Yes. In the proof itself, right? Mm -hmm. You prove something stronger, right? And then you just attach that inequality at the end. Yeah. Um, if you want to understand why it's valid to do that, it's because P is equivalent to P or Q. Um, P, what we want to say is P implies P or Q is a tautology. x is equal to the absolute value, or x is less than the absolute value. Right? So I can think of this as a statement p and q. If I know one is true, then this or something else would also be true. And you can do that in a truth table, that's a top right? So if you know that one condition is true, you can append to that any condition with the or connected, and that new statement will stay true. write it specifically like that. I feel like you lose information that way. Like what? Just, like why don't they write, I mean, I mean not you in particular, but I've seen it like that. Like why don't they write it specifically like if x is not negative, then it's absolute value is equal to x and prove that. It sounds oh, like you mean why do they don't write out this all the time? That's just... No, 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 not <laughs> just, I'm saying in general, like, like when they're proving the thing, right? like I see it's like, Oh, they just, they never break it into the two yeah, parts. Yeah, 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 it's a good reason for me. Here's another one. I'll just number two. Let x and y be not real numbers, but assume they're positive. So they're positive real numbers. something bigger, 
because the y is bigger than this. And that's your y squared. So if I assume my x is less than y, it means that your x squared would be less than or equal to y squared. Let's go the other direction. Next time we'll actually use these two lemmas to prove the triangle inequality and we'll prove a lot of things about sets as well as Cartesian products. <coughs> and we should start chapter 5. No, we're not done with chapter 4 so there's no homework due, but chapter 3 homework is due today. Yes, it's all I'm going to use both of them to prove Oh, that's not. Weird. <laughs> oh, sorry.